it has been since 10 months since Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Thousands of lives have been lost. Ukraine is in shambles. The Russian army has failed to make advances it would have hoped for. The Russian economy is expected to shrink by 3.4 to 4.5% in 2022. Europe is facing an energy crisis. In the midst of it all, President Zelensky of Ukraine has sought India's help with his peace formula. This uh, appeal, sort of appeal, comes to within weeks of his foreign minister criticizing India, India's purchase of oil from Russia as morally inappropriate. To discuss this issue, which is having geopolit which is causing geopolitical upheaval around the world, we have with us uh, former Foreign Secretary Kamal Sibyl, and we'll be discussing the appeal of uh, President Zelensky and more in this Sambad session. Welcome to Sambad, sir. Thank you. So to start off with, President Zelensky recently returned from US with an aid package of around 45 billion US dollars. The Patriot missile defense system has been offered to him. This is in addition to the 22.8 billion military aid he already has received from the US. Now he congratulates India on the G20 presidency and to quote President Zelensky is counting on India's participation in implementation of his peace formula. Now what is to be made of this conflicting war and peace stand of President Zelensky? You know, he's a showman and he's been encouraged in this uh, by the West, the United States and the European Union. Uh, you know, he's asked to is invited to every meeting virtually that takes place, including the UN Security Council or the G20 meetings or even the Cannes Film Festival uh, because he's a very good communicator. And he has the wind behind him because uh, the US and uh, European Union public opinion uh, is determined uh, to back him in order to inflict a military defeat on Russia, if possible. Um, so I, I don't think that uh, Zelensky's peace formula should be taken seriously. It's a, since Putin keeps saying that he is ready uh, to end the war and uh, wants uh, Ukraine to negotiate, he has in that sense put the ball in the, co in the court of Zelensky and the West, particularly when he says that uh, we had been negotiating the two sides, that is Russia and, uh, and Ukraine, uh, but then suddenly after there seem to have been progress in these talks around March or whatever, uh, suddenly the Ukrainians uh, who had made acceptable proposals uh, totally backed off. Uh, and since then there has been no negotiation. The Russians are imputing this to the intervention of the UK in particular, uh, because Johnson had specifically, according to them, flown uh, to <clears throat> Kiev and persuaded Zelensky that the West would back him completely. And I'm sure that the Americans also uh, dissuaded him to make peace. Then the entire uh, strategy would have collapsed if this had happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so in order to uh, regain some ground in terms of uh, denting uh, Russian, you know, talk about peace and negotiations, as also our own prime minister saying repeatedly, that uh, we must come back uh, to dialogue and diplomacy. Uh, no one can win mili militarily in this uh, conflict. So the only way out is negotiation. And since India now chairs the G20, and also there were some noises from uh, the side of the Americans uh, about, uh, you know, we will not press Zelensky uh, to yield on anything, but uh, maybe uh, one should open up some doors for peace uh, in fact, 30 U.S. congressmen that actually uh, uh, signed a letter addressed to President uh, Biden, Democratic uh, congressman, uh, saying that uh, there should be an attempt to find a negotiated solution. So in order to counter all these uh, uh, things that are happening uh, it, on the ground in terms of international public opinion, so Zelensky has come forward with this 10-point peace plan, which is totally unworkable totally unworkable. Uh, but then uh, he would say, well, I have my peace plan. Uh, so 
uh, and uh, seeking India's uh, support for this peace plan. And Indian side, according to what we have announced publicly, uh, took a very reasonable view that we are always on the side of peace uh, and we will recommend that. And when the time comes, uh, we've been saying we will be glad to be of any assistance if it is required. But uh, if uh, you are going to make a condition, you meaning Ukraine, that uh, Russia should completely withdraw uh, from uh, Ukraine territory, which would include <laughs> Crimea, uh, and pay war reparations, and, the, and that uh, those involved in the war, including Putin, uh, should stand trial. Uh, and things like that, it, 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 it's not fly at all. These are maximalist positions, which are not at all the basis uh, for any negotiations. On the other hand, uh, Russia's position, as again uh, stated by Prime Foreign Minister Lavrov yesterday, is that uh, they are determined to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine. Uh, and uh, they will not stop. Uh, they will do it, however long it takes. Uh, which means, therefore, Ukraine cannot join NATO, and there has to be a regime change in Kiev with the exclusion of what Russia alleges, and which seems to have some truth behind it, that uh, the uh, Nazi-type extreme right-wing people uh, have taken over power uh, in Ukraine from the time that the 2014 uh, coup uh, occurred. So these are two positions which uh, India certainly cannot <laughs> reconcile whether we are president of G20 uh, or not. But I would like to underline that if there is going to be a negotiated solution, the ball really lies in the court of the West and the United States and in particular, but the European Union too. Because you can't uh, have an agenda, a publicly declared agenda, that you want Russia's military defeat, you want to permanently weaken Russia militarily, and that you would be uh, looking for a potential regime change in Russia, and call uh, Putin a war criminal. And then you mentioned about $60 billion of uh, aid that has already gone to Ukraine, but the figure, the total figure would be more around $100 billion. The sort of money that the United States has never, never given to anybody, anybody, including in the Second World War, if you even calculate what was uh, given under the Lend-Lease Agreement according to today's prices. So what does this mean? This means that, they, that from the US point of view, there is a huge geopolitical stake in, if not the defeat of Russia, in a major setback uh, to Russia, which would knock out Russia as a power uh, in, in uh, international affairs, effectively, for the next God knows decade or whatever. Uh, so if these are the stakes, and this is, this is the kind of money that they're willing to put in, and arms aid that they're going to put in, and progressively escalate now with the supply of a Patriot uh, system, uh, then I think uh, the chances of uh, peace in the near future, or the foreseeable future, to me seem rather dim. Sir, I was reading this um, statement by Anthony Blinken, perhaps issued yesterday or this morning itself, where he said that it was good that they got out of Afghanistan because otherwise they would not have been able to invest so much in Ukraine. So in all this uh, benevolence over Ukraine, where does it this leave its strategic competitor China? Because China is getting a free pass, I would say, with the whole focus on Russia and, uh, and Ukraine. Uh, where does this leave this strategic competition with China for the US? A couple of things. One is that uh, this this new uh, line that is that is being taken by uh, Anthony Blinken is a bit surprising, because all this while, if you read the commentary that was coming from from uh, uh, Western think tanks, analysts, uh, major media, was that the U.S. decided to walk out of Afghanistan because they had already identified that China as their principal adversary. And they wanted to shift resources uh, to the Indo-Pacific to counter the Chinese, and actually wanted to put the burden on Europe uh, to deal with uh, Russia. Now, suddenly, there seems to be a change of <laughs> uh, line, where now 
I'm a bit surprised that uh, Blinken is saying that uh, uh, they walked out of Afghanistan in order to be able to support uh, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read between the lines, this would mean that they had it in their plan all along. I mean, you, you, can, you can actually derive a very different meaning from this, that their intention always was to provoke a conflict with Russia over Ukraine, even before Russia invaded Ukraine. In other words, that uh, they were determined to keep militarily beefing up Ukraine's capacity, bring their fighting elements, including equipment, to NATO standards as much as uh, possible, pump in more and more money and, and weapons, uh, create a, a strong, or, or, or let's say recreate a strong NATO alliance in order to bring the Europeans on board, and then uh, push very hard Europe to uh, dealing uh, themselves from uh, Russia in terms of energy supplies, which would then give uh, them, accordingly, according to their calculations, a freer hand in dealing with uh, Russia. So that inhibition that they were dependent on energy on Russia, uh, and therefore they should not push things too far, that inhibition has now been removed from calculations because the energy ties have effectively uh, been ruptured. Uh, so this would mean that there was a game plan which, <laughs> which, which uh, preceded actually uh, what uh, Putin did in terms of uh, sending his forces into Ukraine. So that will make the whole thing uh, look uh, even more complicated, than, make it even more complicated than it, than it is. And add to that what Merkel has said in an interview a few days ago, that uh, Minsk agreements was a way to provide time to Ukraine to build up its armed forces to resist Russia. So one can derive uh, all kinds of uh, not very happy conclusions from this. So, so the, when, when, the, when Zelensky floated his uh, peace formula, people like me, students like me, because I, must, I consider myself to be a student of the subject, did not pay too much attention to it. But I was reading through the peace formula yesterday when he uh, sought India's help. And two things which struck me was that he makes mention of restoration of Europe, Ukraine's territorial integrity, respect for UN Charter, and secondly, new security architecture and security guarantees for Ukraine. So this inter area means that Russia gives up whatever it has gained, Donbas, Crimea, you mentioned, and NATO officially entering enters Ukraine. Is am I correct uh, when I read this? Or I mean, the first part, the first part. The first part, you're right, uh, and this has been the consistent position of the Ukrainians, that they will throw the Russians out and reconquer not only the Donbas, but also, and not only those four regions that have been incorporated into Russia, but also Donbas, as well as uh, Crimea. But uh, the second part is not necessarily uh, true, uh, because if you are talking about security guarantees for Ukraine, what the Russians have been saying all along before they, in fact, uh, started their military operation, that uh, all the concerned parties can together uh, provide security guarantees, which then would be ratified by the UN Security Council, which means United States, UK, European Union, uh, Russia, uh, the Poland, state, Poland, Baltic states, well, they are part of the European Union in any case. Uh, so it will be a collective uh, guarantee, uh, security guarantee. But from the Russian point of view, the, the unacceptable part, totally unacceptable part of any security guarantee would be Ukraine joining NATO. Because that was the whole reason why the entire, entire uh, conflict has erupted in the first place. Uh, so... I think the Ukrainians have left this vague. But on the other hand, if you look at what they have done, they have included the NATO membership as part of their constitution. Mm -hmm. So if tomorrow some kind of security guarantees have to be given by concerned parties, then their constitution has to be amended. And if the constitution has to be amended, then the present regime cannot remain in power because they are the ones who have amended the constitution. So there are huge complications uh, down the line. And uh, 
And then, if you know, if you if you see in September, was it or December? I forget the date. Uh, the U.S. Ukraine agreement, which clearly spells out that uh, United States will work for U.S. for Ukrainian membership of NATO, mm -hmm. and their entire military uh, would be brought up to NATO standards. It's a very clear uh, reiteration, much more strongly. Uh, than what was done in the Bucharest summit and the Madrid summit of keeping the doors open uh, to Ukraine for NATO membership. This goes further than that and actually very clearly spells out that uh, Ukraine will be admitted to NATO. So uh, I think uh, the Ukrainian side is being, <laughs> is being hypocritical uh, uh, when they say this uh, about uh, wanting security guarantees because they can't say at this stage that uh, that they will be uh, that the security guarantee will be security will be guaranteed by NATO. Then there is no basis for negotiations. Mm -hmm. So this is just a, a clever way of uh, uh, of uh, confusing and masking what really the Ukrainian regime currently would want. But the Ukrainian people continue to suffer. They are coming to President Zelensky now. The Western media has projected President Zelensky as as somebody who is a who is a defender of the liberal world order. How true is this image? You know, I, when I see that, I, 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 you know, it's very very surprising that uh, this kind of totally unfounded and uh, hypocritical language is used to justify. Uh, what is happening. Uh, from the Indian point of view, what was this liberal order? Just ask yourself, uh, for how many years this liberal order was building up Pakistan against us, mm. pressuring us on Kashmir, pressuring us on human rights, and um, much more importantly, for decades, imposing severe sanctions on us in order to curb our nuclear and our missile program, deny us the dual technology, etc. Currently, if you look at Western media, and it's not only uh, United States media, principal media, but even European media, they are so anti-India, anti-Modi, anti-government. Uh, and you see the total gap between the reality in India, which may have some ugly sides, no doubt, and the manner in which they are portraying it. Uh, portraying it. So is this the liberal order from our point of view? And was it a liberal order when uh, Yugoslavia was destroyed, when Iraq was destroyed, when Libya was destroyed, when Syria has been <laughs> destroyed. Uh, was it a liberal order when China was allowed to uh, militarize the South China Sea uh, without any real reaction from uh, the, the United States? So I think uh, we should not be trapped by such uh, language. Unfortunately, our own, some of our own columnists and our press uh, use this phrase liberally, you know, as if it, it is the reality. It's not the reality. We must keep our head school and, and not be uh, confused uh, by uh, formulations which really are not rooted in reality. What the liberal order means uh, is uh, the hegemony of the West and its ideas and its values. Now, I also don't want to sound as if I'm anti-West or anti-this or anti-that. That's not the issue. Uh, we have to look after our national interests, mm -hmm. which is currently being served by close develop close ties with the United States. We should which we should continue to build. We should not take an ideological view uh, of this. Uh, and whatever this so-called liberal order, uh, if we can profit from this, because globalization was also in some senses part of this, we should do so. And in terms of uh, our technological development, modernization, investment, and everything else. Uh, we are signing FTAs. We signed with Australia, with the UAE, but we want to do it with Britain, with the European Union, with Canada. We want to solve trade issues with the United States, which has become our biggest partner. I, I support all that. But that doesn't mean that we should buy into uh, their way of, of uh, uh, presenting to the world uh, the global realities. We should be able to independently assess what the global realities are, are and, uh, and look through whatever is uh, hypocrisy, double standards, uh, 
and uh, propaganda. But in, in, even in a literal sense, uh, with his political actions against his uh, political opponents in Ukraine and elsewhere, is President Zelensky a liberal? Oh, absolutely not. Oh, absolutely not. Uh, he's a puppet in the hands of uh, these uh, extreme right-wing forces, which certainly have Nazi-linked uh, elements uh, to it. See, the short point is, and that's the reality on the ground, Western Ukraine uh, has never really been part of Ukraine. Uh, it, these territories were incorporated by Stalin into Ukraine. Uh, so they are actually, even President Putin has recognized that in his speeches, if you read it, that Western Ukraine is Central Europe. It is, it is not Ukraine. Uh, and therefore, there is a talk in, uh, in circles in uh, Russia uh, that uh, one solution eventually uh, would be that the Western part of Ukraine uh, is merged with Poland and part with Hungary. Uh, you know, the states from which territories uh, were taken. Uh, so there is definitely a very serious uh, religious and ethnic and cultural divide between Western Ukraine and the rest of Ukraine. And Western Ukraine, mind you, if you look at it historically, uh, were actually collaborating with the Nazis. Mm. And it is the Ukrainian Bandera and everybody else, that group, which actually uh, were... Uh, participating in uh, in uh, activities in uh, the concentration camps. And this Babi Yar uh, 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 concentration camp was in, in Western Ukraine, what is Western Ukraine today. Uh, and these are the people uh, who, backed by the Ukraine uh, diaspora in the United States especially, uh, who have uh, who have taken over power in Ukraine in a larger geopolitical game vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And there, if you go back to what um, Brzezinski said, that uh, the key to isolate Russia and, uh, and make it a non-European power and cause the breakup of his empire was to separate Ukraine uh, from Russia. So this is a long-standing uh, uh, objective of the, of the United States. So Zelensky is just a pawn in this game. And he's a very convenient pawn. First of all, he's weak, but he's very, very good in, uh, in communications. He had this TV channel. Actually, he became president because of this. There was no uh, you know, electioneering as such. As he was doing it all through the digital uh, means uh, because he had this television uh, station. And actually, he was part in a, participating in a series where he was acting as president of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And it so impressed the audience in, in this uh, persona, fictitious persona, as the president of Ukraine, they elected him. And he was elected on a peace formula to actually reconcile with the Donbass. This was his uh, platform. Uh, but then he was, uh, he was uh, made a prisoner of other geopolitical calculations, and we have the situation that we have today. So this utter nonsense, I'm using this word very advisedly, that he's fighting for democracy and for humanity. I mean, Ukraine is fighting for democracy and humanity and this and that, and he's Churchillian. A complete nonsense. So coming to Putin and Russia, it's been 10 months since the invasion started. The Russian... Uh, Military, by all means, ha has not lived up to its reputation. I mean, by, by the looks of it, the economy is in a down spiral. And by all means, it looks that uh, Vladimir Putin is becoming, is making Russia the junior partner of China in the whole scheme of things. So how would Vladimir Putin be reflecting on these past 10 months? As far as I can see it, uh, what he has done, he has done very reluctantly uh, with his back to the wall. I mean, let's just look at the facts. The Minsk agreement was 2014-15. He invaded in 2022. Huh? For eight years, eight years he waited for the Minsk agreement uh, to be implemented, which would have preserved the unity of Ukraine. Uh, I don't want to go into details. Uh, 
people know them already. All that was required was autonomy uh, for the Russian speaking parts of Ukraine, that is the Eastern Ukraine. But this was uh, not uh, implemented and some rational uh, Western commentators recognize that, uh, that um, if this had been done, there would have been no need for a war. And even, even then in uh, September, I think, uh, if, if, my, if my memory is correct, correct, or January was it, uh, before the invasion, uh, Russia actually presented to the United States a, 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 dis a discussion on what was what needed to be done uh, to prevent a conflict and develop a new security architecture which will be based on indivisible security or equal security for all and would require certain steps to be taken by the United States in terms of lowering the NATO threat to Russia. But this was dismissed mm -hmm. uh, out of hand. Uh, and then Putin has explained publicly that uh, if Ukraine becomes part of NATO, we are left defenseless. You know, even now with their drones, they're attacking the Saratov base where their nuclear bombers are, are stationed. Now, if NATO came into Ukraine, they have no defense left. He says, I have nothing to retreat back to. Uh, and the parallel would be the same if uh, United States, Russia built a uh, let's say, build bases and made Ukraine part of some Russian security architecture in, 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 in North America. Would the United States, United States accept it? Certainly not. Uh, but this kind of objective reality of, of the situation is simply uh, not uh, uh, brought into the arguments. And there is a you know, propaganda only in, in, in one direction. That is one. The other is, you're absolutely right. The Russian uh, military has performed badly, I would say. Uh, why this is so, there are explanations. Uh, one explanation, which seems reasonable, is that uh, Ukraine is, you know, Ukraine is the largest country in Europe. 45 million population. Uh, with a history of resistance even to uh, the Soviet Union uh, when they were together uh, from the West. Uh, 200,000 troops, uh, how can you, how can you uh, realistically obtain your, uh, your goals, military goals with just 200,000? It's just not possible. We have 50,000 troops massed on the Ladakh border. <laughs> so it, maybe his calculation was that uh, this show of force and, and a clear signal that Russia was willing to take military action. There will be a change of thinking uh, in, in, in Kiev. And they would be willing then to uh, go back to the Minsk agreements minus Crimea. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen. And I think the Russians knew, but probably did not know enough how much uh, was had been pumped in into Ukraine by way of arms and training, uh, etc. And uh, therefore, uh, they suffered a lot of casualties. Uh, I don't want to go into detail, but the Americans are themselves saying how they have been providing real-time information through their space-based assets to target uh, Russian forces, including the command centers, and they killed some of their generals also. Uh, they penetrated their communication system. Uh, the Americans have shown tremendous, tremendous technological capacity in, during this war in, in this domain. So, caught by surprise, miscalculated, didn't put in enough uh, forces. Uh, number one. Number two, the war is not popular in Russia. So, Putin didn't want to uh, mobilize uh, and create an internal reaction as it is a large number of Russians and qualified Russians, the youngsters who are an asset to society, have run away because they didn't want to be mobilized and lose their lives. Uh, now, because the things on the ground haven't gone well, uh, Putin has been forced to mobilize an additional 300,000. Uh, but even now, uh, 
you know, many of these people, uh, I believe, according to what I read, uh, are from the ethnic nationalities of Russia. The core Slavic uh, mm -hmm. Russians have not yet been tapped uh, into tapped uh, into this uh, process in full strength. So Putin is fighting a double double war, one one external, one internal. Uh, if if you one may not call the internal situation a war, but he has to manage the internal situation so that the public opinion remains behind him. Added to this is that uh, most Russians don't think of Ukrainians as, uh, as an enemy or different from them. They've been together for 300 years. It's like the Biharis and UPIs. You know, there may be some differences here and there, but same people, same cultural roots, uh, same religious roots. And a lot of intermarriages, a lot of families who who are, who are Russian living in Ukraine, Ukrainian living in Russia, uh, and they therefore are worried what will happen to their families. They don't want to inflict too much pain uh, on them. They don't want to alienate them permanently to that extent. So these are some inhibitory factors. But uh, the short point remains that uh, the Russian arms, uh, whatever the inhibitions on. Uh, Putin side have not performed have not performed well. In a sense, Russia is fighting uh, with 20th century weapons against the 21st century technology provided by the Americans uh, to the Ukrainians. Sir, India has re consistently refused to condemn uh, Russian action at the UN. Uh, while PM Modi, Prime Minister Modi, has publicly told Putin, Vladimir Putin, that this is not the era of war. So how do you assess the Indian stand? Very sensible, very sensible. And uh, it is focused on our national interest, uh, our long-term uh, thinking about where we want to position ourselves globally. Uh, we cannot uh, aspire to be what we are if we uh, become a part of one set of countries against another set of countries. Uh, I mean, I, we don't have to call ourselves the pole. It'll be a long way before we uh, s become that kind of a uh, power in the world. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, as you can see, uh, we are inclined now more and more to speak for the global South. We have, we have established our credentials. And we are in a happy position, barring our problem with China, but I'll come to that, that we can talk to everybody. We can talk to the Americans, we can talk to the Russians, we can talk to the Ukrainians. And we have kept our channels of communication with China open also, with all these <laughs> military level, diplomatic level talks, and what Wang Yi said the other day, which is hypocritical. But then nevertheless, he has said publicly, you know, we want to have a stable relationship with India and stuff like that. That has positioned us very well globally, and is going to help us a lot in our G20 presidency, because we have positioned ourselves in the middle, where all sides see value in India's position. Uh, if we had not done that, if we had condemned uh, Russia, our G20 presidency would have actually been a failure. Because uh, there would have been no credibility in terms of our presidency if, uh, if uh, we were actually buying into the agenda uh, of the other side. So. This gives us uh, uh, a, a position of a prospective intermediary, uh, someone that can bring both sides together. With regard to Prime Minister's uh, um, words about this not being an era of war, it's all right. We have, uh, we have milked this uh, as much as we could in terms of our diplomacy. And the West has helped us in this. But the West had a, an agenda in doing so. You know, it's not as if uh, they they really believe what uh, the intention of the prime minister was, that it was a rebuke to Putin. It's certainly not a rebuke to Putin. Mm -hmm. But they have they deliberately projected it as a rebuke to send a signal to the Russians that even your closest friends and this and that are now distancing themselves from you. They're advising you against this conflict. Or not, they're advising you uh, not to pursue this and stop the conflict. Now, I can understand this if on the American side, the European Union side, there was actually a desire to negotiate and find a peaceful solution. 
then I think what India said could have made sense because the entire burden of continuing this conflict was on Russia. But when the Prime Minister says this is not an era of war, I interpret it differently. He's telling both sides. Both sides. The ones who are fomenting the war from the West and, of course, Russia, which is engaged in a conflict. But the Americans have, and the Europeans have twisted this uh, to mean something else. Uh, and number two, if you see how the whole conversation went, I watched it myself. Putin himself in his public, you know, part of the discussion that was public, that uh, uh, you have spoken to me, we have spoken several times on the phone, you express your concerns, you have talked about dialogue, this and that. I also want the war to end. Uh, but the other side is not ready for it. And then the prime minister says this it's not an era of war. It, it flows naturally in response to what Putin has said. Putin gave him an opening. Supposing Putin had not given him an opening, and then the prime minister said this, then it could be interpreted differently. But be that as it may, uh, we have been lauded uh, for this, so, so be it. Obviously, it was not a rebuke, sir. So no. uh, on that note, I would like to thank you, sir. It's been an enriching session. And uh, yeah, I mean, we have learned so much during this half an hour. And uh, thank you so much. And we would like to come back to you for another session sometime on a relevant issue. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. Thank you. Namaskar.